Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through a few adventures and adventure locations for old school essentials or uh, just sort of generic, you know, system neutral games uh, or, you know, system neutral products, basically. Uh, these are awesome. There's going to be four documents, but one of them has seven locations in it. So really, I guess it's like 10 different adventures or adventure locations, but really it's just four documents and they're all pretty short, just a few pages. But I wanted to go through them because, especially with one of these, I think it's awesome. It's really, really cool. The last one I'm going to be going through. The rest are pretty good too. I mean, don't get me wrong. They're, they're, they're fun, cool products. And uh, again, they're all free or pay what you want on uh, DTRPG. So uh, you guys can go check them out. I'll put links below to where you can get them. The first one I'm going to be covering is Downsized Dungeons, which is the Scarlet Tower. This is issue four from Downsized Press. The second one I'm going to be covering is the Temple of Dinus, which is, or Dinus, Dinus, I don't know how to say it. It's this Lizard Folk Temple. Uh, this is by Vance Atkins, and this is only six pages. This is for OSE. Then the Sanctuary of Oias, or Oias, but it's also known as Dwarves Behaving Badly. This is nine pages, uh, and it's also for OSE. And then the last one is Ill Met in the City. It's nine pages, seven picaresque and disreputable urban locations. This one's awesome, and I wanna, uh, I'm really looking forward to getting back to that one. Let's start with uh, the Scarlet Tower. So this is basically just John Carter of Mars. I mean, it's it's set on Mars. This helium is mentioned. You're, you're going for John Carter's saber. There's the jewels of uh, Dejah Thoris, I think is, uh, uh, yeah, wedding jewels of Dejah Thoris is here. It, it, this is just playing on uh, Mars with a John Carter adventure references all all that stuff. Uh, there's Barsoom, there's Jedi Tardos, Moors. It's if you know John Carter, you'll know a lot of the references in this adventure. You don't, you definitely don't have to set this as John Carter, but it really is meant to be that. But you could take it and adapt it for your own game. Um, you have brief descriptions of the place here. It's, it's, it's a large tower coming up out of the. Uh, out of the landscape, you have um, a really interesting little piece of art here from Edgar Rice Burroughs. This is, I think it's the original, yeah, uh, a custom lithographic book plate used in his personal library. That's what it says there. That's really cool. That's really cool. Um, and then there are quotations from the God of Mars. Uh, each of the sections is, is, a, is a quotation from uh, the God of Mars. So that's really cool. This is a, it, it's, it feels more like a I don't know, like a tribute or something like that than a full-on adventure. But you could certainly use it, if, especially if you're playing something, um, you know, on Mars or if you're playing, you know, John Carter of Mars or, or any of those um, RPGs that relate to it. I think it'd be great. Or if you just wanted to play like a reference, like a tribute adventure to it. But that's it. That's the whole thing. You just get a few pages and then you get the stat blocks. There's that Aris, there's a Dangan Guard, and then the treasure. And the, the Saber of the Virginian is really cool. I like that. And then you get the maps and illustrations on the back page uh, if you want to use it for this adventure. Now, again, that's it. It's just four pages. It's free. You can pick it up right now. Uh, I really like Downsize Press. Uh, their Downsize Dungeons have been cool. I had issues with one of them, the first one. I think this is a great little, you know, offering. You can just take it, add it into your game, and you have like one or two references, right? I, I don't know if I, I, I don't run, you know, John Carter of Mars. I don't run games set there, <laughs> but... Um, even if you're not doing that, you just want like a bunch of references to that. If your players are, you know, familiar with John Carter of Mars or Edgar Rice Burroughs, you just want it. Maybe even just for your own sake. Sometimes I'll include references to things, even if my players don't know, just because I get a kick out of it. I think if you did something like that, this would be great. Um, you could run it as a one shot as well, but that's it. That's the whole thing. I really like it. I think it's really cool. The definitely not a huge a huge offering, but it's not it's not trying to be, and it's it's a just a free PDF. So I'd say go pick it up, and you know even if it just makes you go and read John Carter of Mars or something, <laughs> right? Then that that will have done its job as far as I can tell. But it's a great little adventure. So Downsized Dungeons, The Scarlet Tower. I would say this is probably um, I I really preferred issue two and three. I think. Um, Issue, no, issue one was really good, sorry. I think issue one and three are my favorites. Uh, issue two was the one I, I um, the one in the mine. I forget which one it was. That was my least favorite. I think this is above that, but it's not as good as the other two. Is It's not as good as the Lizard Folk Temple. And I don't think it's as good as the uh, the tomb. Um, but the other the other ones are all great. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a solid adventure. 
Right, the next one, as I said, I'm going to be looking at is the Temple of Dynas, which is uh, an adventure for second to third level parties. This is a very small adventure. This is something you're going to put into, a, uh, this is a one shot, essentially. Uh, the idea here is that there's this old temple in the swamp somewhere, and these lizard folk, it's an old lizard folk temple, and they've started to go back to it, and the townsfolk are kind of un, uh, uh, wary about it, and uh, the lizard folk are starting to cause some trouble. They've started, you know, maybe there's some, some skirmishes or some raids or something like that, so you got to go and deal with them. It's a very small map. This is a whole adventure, seven rooms, and really, it's very open, so you're kind of only going through, like, maybe one, two, maybe, like, four different locations, right? There's room one, room four... Um, and then five and seven, with some chances for random encounters in there. Uh, I got like you, know, you have an offshoot at three. You could hunt around in the different tombs and seven, but really you're looking at just a pretty straightforward little adventure location, right? This is something you put into a hex crawl. This is something you I think would work great as, as something you put into a hex crawl. It's very self-contained, very small. It's a bite-sized chunk of content. I always like these sorts of things. So I would say yeah, put this into a uh, into a hex crawl. Or run it as a one-shot, or put it as a side quest, or as an option in your town, as a thing to go and explore nearby, as a trouble that's happening, right? This is not going to be um, against the Cult of the Reptile God. That's not the scale of this, obviously, right? That's a dungeon, that's a whole thing, it's an adventure. This is it's a you know, minor campaign. This is just a very small, um, you know, one-shot adventure. You have a What's Going On page with the info there and some rumors. What's interesting here is that, yeah, there has been some trouble from the lizard folk, but... They haven't been, like, outright attacking, and the plan isn't to go take over the town or anything like that. It's, it's kind of just to, I don't know, the lizard folk just want to raise some undead lizard folk to one of the guys to, like, you know, establish his own authority. Now, granted, that would probably then be aggressive and stuff like that, so maybe you could certainly expand this. Maybe the players have to deal with some of the lizard folk to fight Tooth or Thuth, probably Tooth, uh, the shaman on the other side, uh, but... You wouldn't have to do that either. You just go out here and, you know, just kill them all. <laughs> That's probably what's going to happen. You have some interesting uh, ad encounters here. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is there's, there's, a, there's a trap in the first room. That is, you can kind of skirt around it, and there's no reason not to, um, except uh, there's a, an altar with some, some minor valuables, and they're very minor. You're looking at a few gold pieces and a pearl. I mean, the players might want to be drawn to that, but there's very clear signs that there's a trap here, and it's very easy to avoid. So if you want to go for the, the, the treasure, you kind of know what you're getting into, and maybe the players can think of a way of getting the treasure without approaching the statue. I like things like that. That's cool. It's a cool trap because it's, it's not necessary. It's pretty obvious, and there's a reward for engaging with it that's it's optional. Uh, and the reward is very apparent. Okay, there's treasure that we can get if we approach the statue, but we're probably going to get blasted if we go close. I like that. There's a very heavy statue in the next room, which is very valuable. I always like that, right? Okay, this is 150 pounds. How do we easily get this? But it's worth 200 gold. So what do we do there? That sort of stuff is really cool too. Uh, if you if you search through the, the, the debris, you can get some extra treasure. It's, it's essentially a very, very proficient, very, very small dungeon crawl. This is all well constructed. It's put together quite well. Um, the encounters seem interesting, the treasure is hidden in the right way, the traps are engaging. It's just a great little, um, you know, B plus, A minus, just in terms of scope. I know that, well, it's, not, it's not bigger, it's the only reason I don't give it a solid, just straight up A. What it's doing, for what it's doing, I would say it's an A. But in terms of its, you know, like the, the, the scope of this adventure, it's just a very minor thing you'd put into a, a campaign. But the players are going to have fun. If they're in that old school mindset of, you know, go to a place, beat traps, kill monsters, get treasure, this is absolutely straight up. It's not a lot of role playing. You're not a lot of, there's no politics here. You're just going in to fight some lizard folk, um, kill them, and get out. I like that. Now, there is some powerful stuff here in terms of uh, spells and magic items. You can get some new spells and a new magic item, which is really, really, really strong, it seems to me. Uh, now there are links here, hyperlinks. This takes you to, to YouTube, to what the, the, the Ocarina of Death sounds like. I, I assume I actually haven't followed that link. Then you get links to all this stuff too. But uh, I think that's really cool that if you want to hear what the, the, the Ocarina of Death sounds like, and you got a cool picture of it here, then you have that going right through. Um, and it's a very powerful magic item. It makes creatures of four hit dice or less just save versus spells or faint for 1d4 plus 1 rounds, or, oh, and I should say, anyone with a con of 7 or less has to make a second saving throw or die of fear. That's, I mean, it's a, it's a, 
you know, double-edged sword, because if your party happens to have anybody with a con of seven or less, then that means you use it, they just have a chance of dying. Um, so what's interesting is that the foes are the ones that have to make the hit dice, but then anyone with a con or seven, I don't know if that applies to just the foes or to anyone. So you could roll it either way. So this is the whole adventure, right? It's just six pages. But as you can see, I think it's just a solid little drop-in adventure where you're dealing with undead lizard folk and a lizard folk shaman and some old lizard folk stuff. So if you have that sort of thing in your world, you drop this in, no problem. Easy one shot. I really like this. All right, the next adventure is the Sanctuary of Oias or Oias. I prefer dwarves behaving badly. <laughs> it's a much better name. Um, and the adventure is really good. It's really good and it's unique in a couple ways. So first of all, the idea here is that there's, a, there's this old dwarven shrine out in the mountain somewhere. Um, and there's a cool little like background to it that's kind of described. At, it's like at the moment you kind of get a bit of fiction as the thing came up and there was this temple with this god and then a, a something else came and, and wrecked everything. And then they collapsed it and trapped it down there. Um, but now it has called out to other dwarves. And this other dwarf has come in there and he's like, hey, I'm, I've got to go free my god. Because he thinks that this thing that just come with the demon that just come up out of the depths is his god. It's not. It's, a, it's tricking everyone, but it's trying to get out. And so the dwarves have gone, some dwarves have gone back to try to let it out. And you're kind of, kind of you're, maybe you're trying to stop them before they do. There's a timer element, basically, that um, this thing is trying to get out and they're trying to let it out. And you have a certain amount of time to get to where they are and to stop them. And if you don't, or if you get there while they're doing it, then the combat breaks out, the thing breaks out, and you can fight it. There's a couple other interesting ways to encounter it, too. There is, like, a mud golem in a different room that will... It, it fights anybody, but it will focus on the demon if, it, if it's let out. So there are some interesting... No, I wouldn't say faction play, but there's some interesting dynamics that you can take advantage of as players in this dungeon. I think that's really cool. Probably the dwarves themselves are not going to be so happy when it comes out and it's revealed what it is, so they'll probably fight on your side. So even though it's a low-level adventure, the creature's kind of hard, but that's because you're going to get some help, it seems to me, when you fight it. Or you could stop the dwarves early and the thing is just trapped down there. Now, what's interesting is that you get the whole level of the dungeon. It's a straightforward dungeon. There's some tricks and traps and things to deal with. Uh, there's an there's a automaton guardian to interact with. That's kind of cool. But uh, there's an entire second level to the dungeon uh, below the first level. But you can only get to it if the thing is let out and you kill it because it's trapped down there. So if the dwarves open up the, the lower levels, it's going to come out. You're going to have a big boss fight with it, kill it, or die. But if you kill it, then the entire bottom level is open to you. And there are a couple more demons down there, and it's another thing to explore, and there's some treasure and some magic items and stuff to find. But I really like that. I think it's interesting to have the boss fight on the first level, and then the optional second floor to go into if you want to. That's kind of a cool dungeon idea, and I haven't really seen that before. Usually it's the, you know, the final boss is the bottom of the dungeon. But this idea of there's a dungeon, a level, and it's pretty small. You can do it in maybe a session or two. You get to the final fight or not, right? Maybe you just stop it, in which case this bottom level is sealed off. It feels much more, I don't know, real. Like the reward for a successful fight is another dungeon to explore. That's really cool. I hadn't really thought of it, things in those terms before. The reward is another dungeon. Um, so that's kind of cool. But there, it's a tough one because there are some four hit dice demons down here. There are some... Um, hard encounters down here, but there's also like plus one plate mail down here and stuff. So there's some really good magic items you can find. Um, and some scrolls and things like that. You get some extra items and spells, which is pretty cool. Uh, you got Agimorian, Agimorian Antimony, which is an ore that has, found, has been found to have qualities that affect demon, demonic and similar abyssal beings. The ore may be used to amplify summoning effect, efforts and increase chances of success if utilized in a ritual circle. Conversely, it may also be incorporated into barriers or devices to either block or control a demonic entity. Demons are susceptible to the antimony, taking d8 damage for two rounds for each piece that hits. The ore is consumed during both summoning and combat actions. So I, I would imagine there's some way of making this into a cool magic item, right? Like infusing it into a blade and getting a, an anti-demon blade or something like that. That's really cool. Um, and then you get the description of the Dwarven God that was originally being worshipped down here and uh, who would be very grateful if you were to clear his shrine. Um, and it's a really cool idea. I think this is a really interesting idea for the initiation. I, I want to kind of steal this. The idea that in order to, um, to initiate into his worship, these people had to be suspended in a deep chasm 
or left in this, you know, played out abandoned mind and just all the light had to be taken away. And they said to sit there in the darkness and then hear him. It's kind of cool, but it makes sense why this creepy demon would take advantage of that, because it's pretty creepy. <laughs> but I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a cool uh, adventure. Yeah, so dwarves behaving badly. Um, it's really just the dwarves on the surface who are behaving badly. The rest, you know, they're just trying to let the guy out. They're not really behaving badly. I mean, objectively they are. But they're, they don't think they're letting out a demon. Or at least the one guy maybe is. It's unclear. You know, is it a cult? Are they actually serving the god? Unsure. Unclear. Um, you could do that however you wanted. You could even do some factions within the dwarves who are here, and there's only a handful of them, but you could have some of them think they're actually freeing the god, some of them think they're, you know, entering into this bargain with this creature and, and maybe turn some against the others, depending on your party level if you wanted to do some of that. Anyway, really cool adventure. I think this is great, and again, it's um, I'll, I'll put a link below to where you can get it. A great adventure from Vance Atkins. All right, the next uh, product I wanted to go through, the next document I wanted to go through, is this Ilmet in the City, Seven Picaresque and Disreputable Urban Locations. You have the Gatehouse, the Black Bull Inn, that bastard Chromus, Heist on the Hoist, the Court of Dusty Feet, the Cachalot, and the Widow Guy Flower, Gilly Flowers Apothecary, and Dr. Zorus's Curiosity Shop. Seven locations, but actually a few of them have multiple locations within them. As you can see, Seven has two. Um, the Black Bull Inn has three, really, kind of four. Um, you just have a whole bunch of different locations. The Gatehouse has a couple locations. Now, the first thing that I felt when I read through this is like, this feels a little bit like Charles Dickens. The names, the ideas, it's a little Dickensian. Then you get that with the picaresque, right? It's very, very Dickensian. But then, as soon as I was reading on it, it felt much more like Terry Pratchett. That's sort of how I, I, I went. Maybe it's just because the gatehouse talks about the night watch and the kind of people involved in that. But if you know Dickens or Terry Pratchett, you're gonna, I think you're going to like this. <laughs> it's really cool. And again, this is a free document. You can get it right, out, right now. What, you, what I love is you have the, the isometric maps or the, the side maps of the locations and a bunch of information about them. So here's the gatehouse, right? You have who is at the gate, what the taxes are if you come through. You have the day wardens, the night watch, uh, the different locations within the gate. Uh, the tavern that's attached to the gatehouse on the inside. Well, maybe it's on the outside. I think it's on the inside. Um, so that, yeah, it is on the inside. So that, you know, the the, the uh, players can immediately go into there. There's a tavern there. Probably they can meet some people there. Madame Tearsheet is in there. That's a Dickensian name. Um, you have the hue and cry rule. So what happens if they sort of fight here? Townsfolk are going to show up. You have the notice. And a couple of interesting NPCs. Jack Pinch and uh, Whippletree, Constable Whippletree. Like, very Dickensian names. I really like that. Um, but just, it's a great thing to throw into your world. You put the gatehouse here, players come in, they're going to get a very clear sense of the, the place. And if you want the gatehouse to be a location, the Goat's Head Tavern to be a location in your world, you put this in, the players are going to remember it because it's just, it's got that, at least in my opinion, it's got that element of whimsy and interest that makes a place like this interesting, right? If you want Jack Pinch to be a character who comes up later, if you want Constable Whippletree to be somebody who comes up later, if you want Jojoba, who's the drunk in the Goat's Head Tavern, the, the drunken outlander who just everyone takes care of and loves because he's, I don't know, he just does all these, you know, drinks and fights. And if you want a, him to be in, in the world, great character, drop him in here. Players are going to meet him first, see him, and then later on maybe he'll show up again. A great location. And they're all like this. They're all interesting and funny and memorable. The second one is the Black Bull Inn, and you've got street entrances and shops, and so you've got a map maker shop and a glass blower shop, a secret gambling den as well. And then you've got the Black Bull Inn itself with different places to stay. Um, you've got the kitchens and the dining hall and the people who are there, and there's great characters here. You have Ursula, who is the proprietor's niece and servant, distraught from being accused of pilfering from the cellar. You've got Goneril, a runaway daughter of a noble house making a living as a jongler. 500 gold piece reward for her safe return. And you've got Lennox, who is her manservant, who's hopelessly in love. You've got uh, Fitzwater, who is an old knight, drunk, and maudlin, takes a shine to any young fighting man, presses him with dubious advice if humored, tries to make a gift of his magic horn, summons Dobbin, an old and cantankerous phantom steed. Really funny characters, and I think they're, again, interesting. Gadshill, uh, charming and self-deprecating, befriends wealthy seeming travelers, and forms a gang of highwaymen of likely victims. Great ideas. What happens there if you spend a night carousing there? With the different chambers you can run into, and again, there's a there's a uh, the gambling den below with simplified gambling rules. If you want to make this a location, so the Black Bull Inn could definitely be a recurring location in your world. Maybe it's the local, maybe it's the place that they go to. It's their it's their base of operations for a while. 
the characters are interesting and funny. They would make connections. Yeah, I love the Black Bull Inn. I might use this in one of my games, or at least a modified version of it, because I really like it. And, and by the way, the map maker shop and the glass blower shop are both awesome too. Both great. The characters there, Mowbray the map maker, and uh, Griffith the glass blower. <laughs> they have like kind of a rivalry. They don't like each other, but they can provide very valuable things for you. And I think that's cool. Okay, and then the next one is that bastard Chromus. This guy is hilarious. He's a kind of mediocre wizard who likes to pull pranks, and those pranks involve... But basically, the one kind of magic he seems to be good at is uh, to, the ability to change his disguise, because he has an amulet, right? That's it. So he can change his disguise and uh, then appear as someone else. And so he likes to do that to people, you know, spy on them, listen on them. He's kind of like a... Uh, yeah, like a meddling, you know, maybe private detective kind of person, because people come to him who want him to do stuff for them, right? They want him to find out information, or they they need help with this, that, or the other thing. Um, and his spells are ventriloquism, detect magic, invisibility, and disguise. So it's kind of the kind of person he is. But he has all of these ways of making himself appear to be stronger than he is, and you're probably going to run into some trouble with him because there's rules about what, when the guards will arrive and stuff. So it's the kind of house you'd want to break into, maybe. Um, it's just really funny. I like this guy a lot. And one of the things he always says is, Fools, it was me, Chromus, all along. <laughs> Again, Chromus never gets tired of this prank. Right, so throughout the campaign, you could have this recurring, annoying prankster, villain, not villain exactly, but just like annoying dude. You could make him more villainous if you wanted. Maybe he becomes sort of an erstwhile ally or something. I think that would be hilarious. Um, yeah. Chromus is a great character, and the players, I'm sure, would think he was funny, and then you could make them super annoyed at him, and the longer he goes, maybe he's like a rival trying to get stuff from them. He steals the thing that they're trying to steal at the last minute. You never know if the guy you're interacting with is really the person, or Chromus. I like that. Heist on the Hoist, it's a big wheel tower, um, you know, a, 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 a towering crane from the river, um, boating on the river, and there's, you know, just each year... There's a tribute from a neighboring subject, and there's a bunch of chests full of stuff. And they're left alone for just a little bit. And um, you could definitely, definitely pull off a heist here. And there's some interesting characters here, right? There's Harroward, who is a prisoner, who's a former outlaw leader who wants to escape. There's the Hawkehurst twins, who are violent and unpredictable. And so there are things to manipulate here. There's Jock Barnes and Young Jim. There's NPCs and a timeline guards and a lot of guards 32 guards outside uh, in the entryway so you've got to be very careful you can't just like rush in and you know attack there's sneedham the tax assessor who works on floors four and five hilarious characters hilarious names and a really cool location for a heist um you give the players this map right and you say okay here's the location here's the brief description of each room here's who works there Here's the timeline. After watching for some time, you know this is going to be basically how things work out, roughly. Right? You don't tell them exactly. What's your plan? If you have the right group, this would be amazing. Super, super fun. Um, you could run something more akin to, you know, um, oh, dang it, what's that game? <laughs> um, the one that's it's all about heists and uh, Blades in the Dark. You could run a Blades in the Dark kind of adventure if you wanted to. Um, do some, um, you know, uh, kind of like throwback moments where... Players could use inspiration to be like, hey, actually, uh, I did this or something. You know, you could do a one shot or you could run it into a regular campaign. Maybe one of the chests includes the thing the players have been trying to get or something like that. It'd be really cool. Then you have a court of dusty feet, which is the outdoor open air uh, court with uh, the long neck gang, who is the Tom Gallo is, is has been caught, this, this bad bandit who has finally been caught, and he's going to be sentenced, but his gang is going to try to rescue him, and they've just as overdue. <laughs> Great name. Uh, you have Bela Fair look. You have a whole bunch of people who are there on trial, and then there's a market as well. Players could stumble upon it. They could uh, be involved, become involved, or they could get, you know, they could get arrested themselves, or maybe they get hired by Justice Overdue to, to make sure that Tom Gallows is actually um, sentenced properly and sent off to the, you know, for execution or whatever it is. You could definitely do that. I think this would be great fun. Great fun as an adventure. Uh, a really cool idea. And again, all this stuff with the crimes and sentences, you put this in your world and it's going to feel not exactly realistic, but more real. And it's going to have that sort of, uh, again, sort of Dickensian vibe, um, I think especially with the names that are used here. You can add, add in your own, but I think if you ran this as a, a straight-up players would remember it, certainly. 
You get the Cashalot, which is a merchant ship, but it's actually inhabited by pirates. And they're pretending to be merchants, and they're uncomfortable being their pirates. They've got to sell the merchandise that they've stolen and get out of here quickly um, because they are just pirates, and they don't want people to find that out. So they have um, a, a an agent in town who's trying to sell the wares. He's trying to... But he's dragging out negotiations because he really enjoys the hospitality of the people, the merchants who are like trying to court him because the prices are so low and everyone's competing. Um, so he wants it. He wants to keep going. And then there are some funny NPCs on the ship. Uh, Crow Eye Jax or Buford, who's this guy who's been hiding out the whole time and he wants to take the ship back. Captain Hagthorpe and Ajax, his mute companion. <laughs> Ned Tighthand. There's a guy named Alan Wake. I love it. It's very, very funny. You get a little ship here and uh, stuff going on. Very cool. And then finally, you have the Widow Guyflower's Apothecary and Dr. Zorse's Curiosity Shop. And it's, they're both built onto a bridge. Super cool. Very uh, London, right? London Bridge style. I, I love this. You basically have an apothecary who can make all of these very interesting things for you. And she can make compounds based on creatures. This would be a very, very useful return kind of character if you have a... If you have a maybe an uh, urban campaign or a city where the players are continually returning, you make the apothecary the widow gillyflower, and uh, over time they're going to probably use a lot of these various powers. All right, the beetle lamp, which is a flameless light, is a candle for an hour. Incense, which ghosts hate. Uh, there's you know, um, thurlac, which cures any disease. There's a compound which you can make to like attract or, or repel a certain creature if you have to. But you have to get one of those creatures. There's a lot of stuff that you would use long term. She has a cockatrice head, for example. That's pretty valuable. You want to buy that, maybe she'll give it to you. Um, maybe you just want to rob her because she has 600 gold pieces and coins and gems in a, in a jar in her house. Maybe someone tells you about that. So that's cool too. And then you've got Dr. Zorse's curiosity shop and he sells and buys weird stuff. And so if you, again, if you have an adventuring party that's more about going out and getting weird stuff, magic items and selling them off and getting loot, Dr. Zorse is one of your, one of your, um, you know, contacts. He's the guy who buys the really rare stuff, no questions asked. He sells you, you know, if you, as long as you're not <laughs> going to ask where he gets his stuff from, you can get some stuff like silvered weapons or exotic eggs or spell scrolls or treasure maps or a key. He can get you the stuff that you need. It's really cool uh, locations, both very interesting and you could use them in a campaign. Again, an ongoing urban campaign and these characters are going to be uh, I would, very memorable uh, very cool locations. Instead of just saying to your NPC, to your PCs, hey, you sell the thing, maybe have them go to Dr. Zorse's curiosity shop instead. Interact with him and uh, get a sense of this guy. Much more fun, in my opinion. So that is seven, or ill met in the city, seven picaresque and disreputable urban locations. This is fantastic. I wish there were more products like this. I'm going to link below to where you can get it. Again, it's free. So good. This is the sort of stuff I love. I hope you guys do too. So we had ill met in the city. The Sanctuary of Oias, or Dwarf Behaving Badly, The Lizard's Tomb, The Temple of Dinus, and Downsized Dungeons, The Scarlet Tower, Issue 4. Alright guys, that's it for today. I'll see you all in another video.